but in a strange way, Seamus became Jesus. And in the secular way that he did, as I planned. There is one of his poems after he became very seriously ill, where he talks about the Bible passage in the New Testament where Jesus is teaching or preaching in front of a house and four people come running up carrying uh, a paralyzed man. I'm sure you know the story. And they can't get at Jesus. So they go up on the roof and they lower him down in front of Jesus. And Jesus says, your sins are forgiven. And there's a, a row. And then he says, it's easier to say your sins are forgiven or to say you're cured. So you're cured. And the guy gets up and walks off. Seamus writes a poem about that because he wanted to thank the four people that had carried him when he was paralyzed with, with his pain. Uh, he had a stroke and he was carried safe to safety for that period into an ambulance by four people. And he thanked these this way, by using this uh, Christian Jesus imagery in a secular way, but focusing on the people, lowering Christ down. Lowering the paralytic down. I was <coughs> asked to edit eight issues of the magazine The Poetry Ireland Review, and for the eighth one, I said I'm going to do my own thing, and I'm going to ask the poets that I know around the world to write a new poem and respond in a new poem to the question that Jesus asked his disciples, which was, who do you say that I am? I thought this was a, a very silly idea and that the academics would floor me and that the poets would be very polite to tell me to go away, please. Um, and I asked two people, first of all, do you think this might work? Now, first of them was Rowan Williams, who was then Archbishop of Canterbury, and he says, great idea, and I help you out with it. And the other one was Seamus Heaney. I asked him, what do you think? And he said, great, he said, go for it. And he wrote a poem, which has not yet been published in book form. It appeared in that Poetry Ireland Review issue. And it is, in fact, the same poem where he is looking back again at the time when he was severely ill and a paralytic person comes in. So it's the same scene as in the earlier poem, exactly the same. But this time, the character that's standing in front of all the people, trying to keep them back, uh, trying to stop them from intruding upon him, is in fact Seamus Heaney. So Seamus becomes the Jesus figure in that poem. And it's, it's in a very effective, very unusual, strange poem. Uh, but he's, he's quite proud of it, he was. Um, so what I see is that the Christian Catholic imagery that Heaney was embraced by uh, remained with him always, right up to the very last minute. And he kind of consciously or unconsciously, returns to it to clarify his own life over again. So in that sense, famous Janus became Jesus. Hopkins becomes Jesus in a far more, uh, far different kind of a way. So I get back to the paper. Uh, it, this is a very personal response, and I want to extend it slightly at the end in, into where we are today to show, I think, that poetry is perpetually relevant. Good poetry is. Seamus Heaney may well be slightly limited because of his seeming invulnerability, but I do believe that he was quite a vulnerable person in many ways and stood trying to keep people back from him. He was being invaded. His personal space was being invaded in the latter years. And he did not know how to say no 
it was such a tangible one. Um, so, the world itself, the physical universe, in Hopkins' sense of thing, things, is shot through with sanctity. There's that God's grandeur poem that you refer to. The universe, for Hopkins, is the bones of God. It's the body of Christ. It is the atmosphere we breathe in and breathe out from. And this is a, a, a stanza from The Wreck of the Deutschland. I kiss my hand to the stars, lovely asunder starlight, wafting him out of it, and glow, glory and thunder. I kiss my hand to the dappled with damson west, since, though he is under the world's splendour and wonder, his mystery must be in stressed, stressed, for I greet him the days I meet him, and bless when I understand. And in a letter to E. H. Coleridge, already mentioned up here, Hopkins said that the main object of Christian belief was the doctrine of the real presence, that is, belief in the actual fullness of Christ's body and blood in the Eucharist. And it is this that brought him to Catholicism. Today, the sacraments of baptism and the Eucharist are still the central powerhouses of Catholic faith. They are the sacraments that open up its, its adherence to consciousness of and participation in the life of Christ, and therefore it enlivens the whole cosmos in which humanity is involved. Conscious all his life, then, of both the wonder and the grandeur of the created universe about him, and of the person of Jesus Christ, to focus in on his actual and changing view of who Christ was, of his personal relationship with Christ, is of huge interest, I think. I'm speaking, as you know, of a poet alive and a priest alive in the last half of the 19th century, long before the modern surge in thought and faith began to gather force long before a real awareness of evolution and its consequences for Catholic belief, particularly the doctrine of original sin. And if that uh, is queried, we're in trouble. An early poem of 1864 is called New Readings. This is Hopkins. And this is the first stanza which is based loose, loosely on uh, Matthew's Gospel. Although the letter said, on thistles, that men look not grapes to gather. I read the story rather how soldiers plaiting thorns around Christ's head, grapes grew and drops of wine were shed. Not a very promising start for a poet, but this is a young poet practicing his craft and already very thoughtful about the Christ, <laughs> where those grapes that grow into wine become emblems of suffering, opening out to joy. About a year later, Hopkins' fluency with the sonnet form comes together with a slightly more promising relationship both to poetry and to Christ. He says, myself unholy, from myself unholy to the sweet living of my friends, I look. I greeting doves, bright counter to the rook, fresh brooks to salt, sand teasing waters, surely, and they are pure. But alas, not solely the unquestioned readings of a bloodless book. And so my trust, confused, struck, and shook, yields to the sultry siege of melancholy. Of course, he can't really trust even his great friends. He is a sin of mine, he its near brother. Knowing them well, I can but see the fall. The fault in one I found, that in another. And so, though each have one, while I have all, no better serves me now, save best. I can't just be better than these. I have to be the best. No other, save Christ. To Christ I look, on Christ I call. Uh, 
he's looking on Christ um, as the ideal. Echoes of the serious playfulness with language of my other favourite poet George Herbert is already in this poem. That same consciousness of sin and of human unworthiness. But there is not yet the argument with Christ that George Herbert had. The consciousness of faults in himself and in others leads him to seeking of what is purest and best. And this may be foreseen in Hopkins, but the awareness of faults suggests a response of melancholy. Something that will take over Hopkins' life as we know in the few years. And then again, later on, he will call upon the Christ. But this time, the relationship will have greatly matured, as will, thanks be God, the poetry. He joined the Jesuits and he spent his novitiate in St. Binos in North Wales, one of the most wonderful places. If you have nothing to do for a week, go on retreat to St. Binos in North Wales. It's a wonderful place to be. He had urged himself to give up the writing of poetry as being an occupation unfit to the serious business of being a priest. And we know how the wreck of the Deutschland came about. Uh, he had prayed and studied in the intermediate years. Uh, he had followed the laying down methods of St. Ignatius of Loyola. So there was an almost mathematical, if not the Euclidean, <laughs> development uh, in St. Ignatius and the spiritual exercises. You do this, you do that, the other. This is the way to pray. You, you image this, you image that. All laid out very carefully and accurately to bring you to God. So this is the way Hopkins was at, at this stage. And then Quam, the ship, the Deutschland, sank. And uh, there were five nuns aboard. Hopkins focused in on these. And uh, he was struck that the five nuns of the Franciscan order had been expelled from Germany. And one of them whom he called the chief sister he described her as a gaunt woman, six feet high, calling out loudly and often, O oh Christ, come quickly, till the end came. And this pushed Hopkins to think more closely, in the form of the wreck, uh, of his own relationship to Christ. So when he was urged to write something, it flowed out from him. And as Gail also picked out earlier on, he has this little stanza, I did say yes. O oh, at lightning and lashed rod, thou hurts me truer than tongue, confess thy terror, O oh Christ, O oh God. So the Christ now is very, very present to him, but present in a, a kind of objective way, out there, a way forward, a mathematical way forward even. But there is the personal thing inside himself, which has been suffering melancholy already, and he says he's gone through a period of what he calls terror. And the Christ is now kind of a terrifying figure. In a state of spiritual doubt or difficulty, he feels, the Christ is frowning on him, and hell is beckoning. How is he to get out of it? And he answers, I whirled out wings, that's well, and fled with a fling of the heart to the heart of the host. Now that's unique in Hopkins. Pretty unique. Um, basically saying, feck it all, I'm going to do this anyway. I fled with a fling of the heart to the heart of the host. Um, it's a beautiful moment. In other words, I said, oh, you know, I was all of that, I believe. Hopkins followed with scrupulous obedience the orders of his superiors. As we know, he suffered intensely because of that in Dublin. So the fling of the heart is a quick acceptance of the urgings, if you like, of the Holy Spirit. And Hopkins struggled always with the urgency that poetry demands and the strictures that the Jesuit order demands. How can you fling the heart and write the kind of uh, inspirational poetry that he asked for, which he described as the roll, the rise, the carol, the creation. Not poems that are laboured over at a desk, 
but these that have the roll, the rise, the carol, the creation about them. And how can you do that with the Jesuits? Bless their hearts, are telling you, go this way. Uh, examine 750 papers of Greek history, uh, letter by letter, you know, as his eyes were going. But he did. The gospel has promised grace, he says, a vein of the gospel proffer, a pressure, a principle, Christ's gift. This is what Christianity is for me. Christ's gift, a vein of the gospel proffer, what has been promised us. And then he goes on outlining where this grace comes from, from Christ's incarnation. He says it dates from the day of his going in Galilee. It dates through that, through the passion, and it's only when the human heart is suffering and is, quote, at bay, that the person will call out in anguish for help. So when you're deeply in pain, deeply suffering, uh, you call in anguish for help. This is where the terrible summons and his Dublin period also uh, partly came from. He says, Hither then, last or first, to hero of Calvary, Christ's feet. Never ask if meaning it, wanting it, warned of it, and then go. So if you're suffering deeply, that's when you call on God, call on Christ. And that's when you want a personal response. So talking about the nun who was up in the shrouds trying to <coughs> console everybody else, he asked himself what she may have meant when he, she called out for Christ. And he says, was it calling on a master, her master and mine? What did she mean? Was it to suffer death as Christ had done? And he quotes, I quote, or is it that she cried for the crown then, the keener to come at the comfort, for the feeling of combating keen? Suffering so much, now I want the crown that comes after. His conclusion is that Christ tests the soul and Christ brings the relief. There then the master, Ipse, the only one, Christ King Head. He was to cure the extremity where he had cast her. Um, so Christ wins glory in Hopkins' view. And Hopkins, in a very late stanza in the Records of Deutschland, offers a hymn of praise to that Christ. Now burned, newborn to the world, double nature of name. The heaven flung, heart fleshed, maiden furled, miracle in Mary of flame. Mid numbered he in three of the thunder throne. Father, son, and Holy Ghost. Not a doomsday dazzle in his coming, nor dark as he came. So, not always necessarily through doomsday or suffering, kind sometimes, but royally reclaiming his own. A release sharp, let flash to the shire, not a lightning of fire, hard hurled. The poem is a tour de force um, and it opens Hopkins up to, to poetry and to the inspiration uh, that he had quelled and it flows out of him, and especially in St. Binos in North Wales it is a very, very beautiful place. I spent some time there. Really lovely. Um, mind boggling in its physical beauty. He wrote there a poem, which I will quote in full. It's an easy enough to understand. It's called The Lantern Out of Doors. Where he's looking out the window in the dark and he sees people passing, carrying lanterns. And he wonders about where people go what they're all doing, and who, who gives a hoot anyway about any of us. Sometimes a lantern moves along the night that interests our eyes. And who goes there, I think? Where from and where bound, I wonder? With all down darkness wide his wading light. 
men go by me, whom either beauty brights in mould or mind, or what not else makes rare. They rain against our much thick and marsh air, rich beams, till death or distance buys them quite. Death or distance soon consumes them. Wind what most I must eye after, be in at the end I cannot, and out of sight is out of mind. Christ minds, Christ's interest, what to avow or amend there, eyes them. Heart wants, care haunts, foot follows kind, their ransom, their rescue, and first, fast, last, friend. Now, and that last line, and all that poem, is a, is a change in Derek Manny Hopkins from the ideal out there, from the Christ of terror and distance and testing, to friend. And uh, this is where George Herbert's poetry comes in very strongly. You know the poem, Love? Love by me welcome, but yes. my soul drew back, guilty of yes. dust and sin. The quick-eyed love, observing me, grow slack from my first entrance in, drew nearer to me, sweetly questioning if I liked anything. And that poem has, ah, my dear. <coughs> so Herbert talks to his God as, ah, my dear. Hopkins uses, ah, my dear. In the Windhover, but in a slightly different context. So he is, he is borrowing from Hopkins, not just the language, but the whole notion of Christ as friend. Very, very important. Then there came another wreck. A wreck must be a great thing for wreck performers about. <laughs> uh, this is, I'm never certain how to pronounce it, the Eurydice, the, the loss of the Eurydice, is the name of the poem. Though the song uh, is Eurydice. So you can't say the loss of that Eurydice. You have to say, I think, the loss of the Eurydice. Um, in 1877, Hopkins had left Spinoza and had moved to Stonyhurst for theology. And there he taught classics. And that's where his life really began to deteriorate. Teaching classics. Not necessarily teaching classics is a, a, a passport to hell, but uh, for Hopkins and his belief in complete and utter obedience and following the letter of the law, it is, it was, a death sentence. Now he found it difficult to write with all this other stuff going on, but uh, Eurydice got him stirring again. It was a training ship, and Orlis was on its way home after a stint in Bermuda. And you know Hopkins was an Englishman to his fingertips, um, a British, British pro-Brexit guy, um, and a military man. He loved military standards, march pasts, and all of that kind of stuff. There were 327 sailors trainers, trained on board of this, and many of them were young men. The ship ran into a freak gale off the Isle of Wight, and all but two of them were lost in the drowned. So that's around 325 young British tars. Hopkins used to holiday with his family on the Isle of Wight, and this time he wrote a very, very different kind of poem to the Deutschland. This is far more of narrative and a tribute to the youths. And his thought is, sudden death for young lads. Had they been to confession? No, probably not. If they hadn't been to confession, are they dying in sin? The Jesuits would say, back then. Catholicism would have said back then, if you die in mortal sin, yes. mm -hmm. you're in hell. That's it. So Hopkins says, uh, De Eurydice, it concerned thee, O Lord. Lads and men, her laid and treasure, death teeming in by her portholes, raced down decks, round messes of mortals. And he's worried that they were caught so suddenly, they well may be, he calls, 
in on Christ. In on Christ. A lovely old word, on shriven. And he wonders why, if that is the case, why his master would allow that. Why would Christ allow that to happen? He does not pursue the question. Uh, he simply urges prayers. He wasn't theologically, I suppose, developed enough to actually pursue that very serious question. He says, but to Christ, Lord of thunder, crouch, lay knee by earth low under, and pray, holiest, loveliest, bravest, save my hero, O hero, savest. Um, already hero, he used earlier on, the hero of Calvary, Christ's feet. And if you know the most beautiful uh, Anglo-Saxon poem called The Dream of the Rood, uh, Christ is seen in that 8th century poem as a hero, crying, uh, climbing deliberately and consciously onto the cross in order to save everybody else. Uh, this is the medieval view of Christ as a great hero rescuing us all. So Hopkins now has him as a friend, and he has him as a hero. Now there's a sonnet called As Kingfishers Catch Fire. Uh, one of the ones that Shane Senior also actually loved very much and spoke about. Uh, this is also, if theologically, I'm not too clear about it, it's done Scotus, the Scotus idea of in scape and in stress. Uh, if you look at somebody, you can see them in their wholeness. Um, and if you look long enough, you can get the in scape of them. So each individual has his or her own in scape. As Alice was pointing to the tree, uh, the tree had an in scape. And is it purely a physical thing? It's not. It, there is more to it than that. But this is uh, Hopkins's way of examining this inscape. What makes an individual an individual? As kingfishers catch fire, dragonflies draw flame. As tumbled over rim in roundy wells, which is definitely a shameless Heaney line. Hopkins was imitating Heaney here. Uh, Heaney loved that word, roundy. Um, as tumbled over rim in roundy wells, stones ring. Like each tucked string tells, each hung bell's bow swung, finds tongue to fling out broad its name. You recognize a bell by its sound, or recognize a fiddle by the way the, the string is plucked. Each mortal thing does one thing and the same. It deals out that being indoors, each one dwells. So what you are indoors, inside, that is you, you're dealing it out. It sells, it group goes itself. Myself, it speaks and spells, crying, what I do is me, for that I came. I say more, the just man Justices, keeps grace, that keeps all his goings, graces, acts in God's eye, what in God's eye he is, Christ. For Christ plays in ten thousand places, lovely in limbs and lovely in eyes, not his, to the Father, to the features that men's, of men's faces. Christ plays in 10,000 places, lovely in limbs and lovely in eyes, not his, to the Father, through the features of men's faces. So we are all Christ's. Uh, we all become Christ. And that is our true selves. This is a very, very much developed view of Christ, as you can see in our friend Jared Money Then poor old Hopkins met his Waterloo and came to Ireland. Thank you.
came to Dublin, where he was wretchedly miserable. And the wonder of it, which has always heartened me, uh, without understanding it fully, is that he came to Monaster Evan uh, for relief and release and found it here. He did go home a few times to England, maybe spent a week, and he would walk the hills and valleys. But you know, while he was in Dublin, he was suffering greatly. He was suffering because of his eyes, which were giving out, and he was suffering because he had examined all of these tests, set them, examine them, and go over them. Uh, and he did so in minute detail, so that he wouldn't upset anybody by giving them one mark less than they should have. Now, at the same time, he was depressed, greatly depressed. Um, some people say that he actually had a, de a depression. I don't think so. I have a theory that Hopkins at that time <coughs> suffered from a, a disease and had suffered from it most of his life. Uh, because even in his earlier years, he had to go into hospital for some operations on his body. Uh, he suffered a thing, I believe, called Crohn's disease. Now, Crohn's disease was not uh, recognized as such until much later on, 1930s or something like that. So Crohn's disease is actually the only thing that would uh, make sense of the pains and illnesses that Hopkins suffered. <coughs> on and on through his lifetime. Naturally, all of this brought him down into a terrible depression. Uh, and being absent from England, and absent from his family, uh, made it absolutely miserable. He suffered from spiritual and physical triumphs. And while there wrote those sonnets we refer to as the terrible sonnets, these would deserve a, a study in themselves in terms of physical as well as spiritual uh, triumphs. Dark night of the soul is too easy a thing to say. Uh, if you're suffering dark night of the body at the same time, it becomes almost impossible. He uses one of uh, the great images from King Lear uh, to describe how low he came, uh, where he says, here, creep, wretch, under a comfort serves in a whirlwind. All life, death does end, and each day dies with sleep. Now that's, that's pretty low, pretty bad. Uh, now there's no complaint that the Christ is unresponding. He says also, my lament is cries countless. He was praying and shouting and calling all the time. But they're not complaints. This is a Jesuit, don't forget. They are cries like dead letters sent to dearest him who lives, alas, away. That phrase, dearest him. Uh, he's like, Christ is still my friend. Uh, but he's not responding to me at the moment. But he, there is no rejection. There is no... Uh, negativity else about it. Now that is also very, very much German E. Hopkins. He comes out of it, sort of, uh, though he does die not terribly long after these sons. Um, he writes a very complicated poem. Uh, the name of which I think I have forgotten. No, it's not I found, but I can't pronounce it. I need the help of people here. That nature is a Heraclitean fire and of the comfort of the resurrection. Does that sound right? Mm -hmm. Heraclitus, 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 mm -hmm. and Heraclitean fire that we are all made of fire as well. Great, it's a great sound. Uh, he talks first of all about after a storm, obviously his own storm as well, but this is a physical storm. He, he describes creation how it deals with things of the earth, the sky, the tree. They are left in pool and rut peel parches, squandering ooze to squeezed dough, crust and dust. Uh, storm is over, you look around the, the grounds and it's chaotic. My 
someone was wrong with look at me and left in such a state. And when faced with all of this, how million fueled, nature's bonfire burns on. Nature will recover. Nature's bonfire carries on. In God's grandeur, he says, but for all this, nature is never spent. There lives the deepest freshness, deep down things. And he's searching for that himself. There is a human fragility in suffering. He says, man shape that shone sheer off, disseverable, a star doth blot, keen out. Nor mark is any of them left at all so stark, but vastness blurs and time beats level. In other words, man disappears. There is no recovering after a storm like that, like the earth recovers. Man is gone. And then he says to himself, and this is an act of will, enough, he says, the resurrection. Enough, the resurrection. It's right in the middle of this poem, which is heading towards bleakness again, and he says, no, enough of this now. There is the resurrection. We are reborn. With suffering and death, with the failing <coughs> of flesh and life, all that is left is ash. And now comes the resolution that he had struggled for for years, from the nun in the wreck of the Deutschland, and the sailors in the sinking of the Eurydice. He knows that all must, all must come to hero of Calvary, Christ's feet. The Christ became incarnate and suffered as all men do, as Hopkins has done. But Christ took on all the sufferings and the death of humanity, and we are all, if you remember, we are all Christ's. So, enough, the resurrection. A wildly optimistic, triumphantly exuberant language finishes this poem. The heart music of the lines, just incredible. The rhythms, the rhymes, just wonderful. All of it comes together in the poem at its majestic and awe-smitten end. In a, <coughs> Excuse me. In a flash, at a trumpet crash. I am all at once what Christ is, since he was what I am. And this Jack, Job, this poor potsherd, patch, matchword, immortal diamond, is immortal diamond. So now suddenly I'm immortal diamond uh, because of the resurrection. Christ, in his death and resurrection, has overcome the flux that Heraclitus, or Heraclitus consigned all of creation to. Here is the destiny of man, as the critic John Pick has written of this, his divinization in the human mode as Christ. This identification with Christ that Hopkins found his way to became a fate for him in his deepest darkness and suffering. And this theme has become common and central to Christian thinking in our times. So I quote from uh, a wonderful theologian of our era called Cardinal Walter Casper German. In a book called Jesus the Christ, he says, faith means ceasing to rely on one's own capabilities, admitting human powerlessness. You admit that, you take on the Christ and you move forward. Now, uh, that's basically it. Um, I was going to quote a poem that I've written. Have I written it? We have a little place down in, in County Leitrim, and there is a, a lane way where we walk with the regular and that's called Cain's Lane. K A N E because somebody called Cain, teacher lived in the area. Only these old country lanes that has not a great deal of traffic going up and down it. So there's grass growing up the middle of the road, of the lane sometimes. And walking along this, uh, this came to me, uh, and thinking about Hopkins and being Jesus Christ. And this applies to all of us. We are all supposed to be Jesus Christ, playing in our faces being us. The substance of the being of Jesus sifts through the substance of man, 
I am God and Son of God and man. Times I feel my very bones become so light, I may lift unnoticed above woods as wood and soar in an ecstasy of being over Acres Lake. Other times I am so dubbed, so drowned, my flesh falls granite while a fluid near congealing settles on my heart. The Christ, frozen in flight on the high flung frame of his cross, leaves me rattled in the grossest of mercies. And I walk the length of Cain's Lane on that ridge of grass and cress and plantain, battening down the centre. I sex my tongue on the flesh juices of blackberries, cinch my jaws on the chalk bitterness of sloes. I am certain and unsettled. I am lost and found in my body. I am sifted through a narrow and serpentine love lane stretched between dawn and night. It's a sense of, uh, of being divine and being human at the same time. Now, if all of humanity is redeemed in Christ, be it all big is, then this Christ identity is universal. If all of humanity is redeemed in Christ, Christ identity is universal. We can all say then, with some sense of its truth, its way and its life, that we are Jesus. For he lives within us, whether we may be aware of the fact or not. Hopkins says, I am all at once what Christ is, since he was what I am. And that we too are immortal diamond. Which is what I felt exactly when I saw a photo in our newspapers of a Syrian three-year-old boy of Kurdish ethnic background, whose image made global headlines after he drowned on the 2nd of September in 2015 in the Mediterranean Sea and was gently, very gently, washed up on the shores like a piece of flotsam. And if you look at the photograph of it, the child is lying there as if he's asleep, as if the Mediterranean Sea is conscious that it has something beautiful and sad here and is handing it gently back to us. Look at what you're doing. And I wrote this uh, thing which I call Refugee. This, then, is the Christ. They named him Alan, Alan Kurdi. He is three years old, red t-shirt, short-sleeved, navy blue shorts, shoes navy blue. He has been washed ashore. He lies face down on the wet shingles. He is helpless. He has been helpless all his life. He was obedient in everything. He was lifted aboard a crowded dinghy. He had few words. He is the Word. In him all things were created, and in him all things hold together. We are part of humanity. We are involved in humankind. We are all part of a developing universe. We are, an engaged, we are engaged in an evolutionary force that works its way towards, as far as we can see, deeper consciousness and optimistically a unity in love that is cosmos-wide in the care and under the direction of God. Therefore, we are involved in the loss of that child. The substance of the being of Jesus sifts through the being of Alan Curley and through us all. As Hopkins did, we may become aware of our involvement in the world, and I do believe Hopkins was way ahead of his time in some subterranean consciousness of an evolving world, a world evolving towards the Christ, which is uh, Teilhard de Chardin and a later development uh, of Teilhard de Chardin's thinking by Ilya Delio. Um, this is my theological offering of the day. Teilhard de Chardin followed by Ilya Delio. Read those two. They're both extremely readable. 
um, people. Moving all of this forward. As Hopkins did, we become aware of our involvement in the world and through the death and resurrection, through the being of Jesus the Christ, we live and grow and love, caring for each other and for all creation, and in the process becoming one with Christ, the Omega. In all of this contemporary awareness, Hopkins, in 18, mid-18 to late 1880s, in all of this, Hopkins was already deeply involved and had, in his last months, become Jesus Christ in his own way. Okay,